Good morning, brothers and sisters. I ask you all to take up God's Word with me. And for the new year, we're beginning a exciting new series. No, just kidding. We're going back to Genesis. Turn to Genesis, chapter 37. We're going back to the tale that's as old as time. Genesis chapter 37, I have lofty ambitions of covering the entire chapter today, so I encourage you to turn there, and while you're turning to Genesis 37, I want to provide a brief recap because it's been about five weeks since we were in Genesis, so let's just kind of review where we're at in the story so far, and we actually have a recap we can pull up on the screen if you're taking notes or if you want to just see a visual there. Could we pull up our recap just so we can see where we've been? So at the beginning of Genesis, we saw God created the heavens, the earth, and he created mankind as unique stewards of that creation to love him, reflect him. But mankind rebelled, we sinned against God, and so we incurred the curse of misery and death upon ourselves. The story of Noah revealed that this sin was not simply something external outside of us, but it was within us because God takes Noah and his upright family, sweeps the world clean, starts over with them, and you give it like an hour, and they're sinning already. So there's an internal problem that needs to be fixed. And so from amongst all the fallen ranks of mankind, God graciously selects Abraham and Abraham's family to be the unique recipients of this blessing. And God promised that through Abraham's offspring, his original good plan for mankind would come to fruition. God had not given up on his creation plan. Sin had distorted it, but hadn't totally ruined it. God was going to bring blessing through Abraham's offspring to make that happen. The only problem was Abraham and his wife were old, and they were barren. They had no children. So God miraculously intervenes, provides this miracle child, Isaac. Isaac grows up and gets married, and he has twin boys named Esau and Jacob. Even though Jacob was the younger one, so the birthright should have gone to Esau, Jacob had been chosen by grace to receive that blessing that was given to Abraham. It now passes through Jacob. Jacob was a deceiver. He was a bit, of a bit of a punk, but God gets a hold of him, changes him, and it renames him Israel. And Israel has 12 sons, and it was from those 12 sons would come the promised offspring that God had told Abraham about, ultimately the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So that's our context, and as we begin this new year, uh, the story is going to shift a little bit. We're going to not look at Jacob as much. The sh focus is now going to shift to Jacob's 12 sons with a specific emphasis on his second youngest son, Joseph. So the question is, what's going to happen to these 12 sons of promise? How is the story of God continue going to unfold through the 12 sons of Israel? And what can we learn in the process? Well, let's go ahead and read our text, Genesis chapter 37. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I've dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, even it says his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I, your mother, and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? Oh, and his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they're pasturing the flock. And the man said, Oh, they've gone away, for I've heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. 
They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. So they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we'll see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. But throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to their father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, or his clothes, and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. Oh, a fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused. He said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard. This is God's word. Let's seek his help in understanding it this morning. Oh Lord, we thank you for these scriptures, and I pray and ask that you would give us wisdom and discernment in them. I pray and ask that you would fill us with gratitude for all of the privileges we've been given in Jesus Christ. I pray and ask, oh Lord, that you would convict us of any sin that is in our hearts. Would you purify us of that, and would you conform us to the image of your Son by the power of your Holy Spirit through the truth of your word? We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Perhaps you've heard the expression to be green with envy when you're really coveting after something. Maybe you're familiar with where the expression green with envy came from. Well, it actually originates from a line from one of Shakespeare's plays. One of the plays that William Shakespeare wrote was called Othello. Othello was a tragedy. A tragedy was an old type of play where basically the hero makes a lot of tragic mistakes and the whole thing just gets out of control and pretty much everyone ends up dead in the end. That's a, a tragedy. And the story of Othello is a story about envy and jealousy. And basically the plot of Othello is Othello is this king who passes up on a promotion. One of his, his right-hand men, his name is Iago. Iago is really hoping for this promotion. And Othello passes him over and gives it to somebody else. And Iago is filled with jealousy. I should have had that promotion. That belonged to me. So he begins conspirating about how to get his revenge on Othello. And he gets his revenge by convincing Othello, using some reverse psychology, that Othello's young wife is actually running around with another man. And so it begins to breed this jealousy in Othello. And so think about it. Iago's filled with jealousy. And to get revenge, he begins filling Othello with jealousy. And so it's a story of these two men whose jealousy is just escalating and escalating and escalating until eventually everybody ends up ruined and destroyed in the end. And there's one line in this, this play where it says, Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. And so in this story, we're going to read about the green-eyed monster of jealousy that drives the plot. And as we do, there's several movements here. I want to look at there's two big movements in the story, and then there's application from each of those movements I want to examine. So here's the first part of our story, verses 1 through 11. We see our first point, that Joseph's brothers harbored angry jealousy against him. Well, let me ask, did anybody have any dreams last night? If you, maybe you stayed up late, you barely had time for a dream because you were up celebrating and then you rolled out of bed and came here. 
I don't know if you had a dream last night, but you know, dreams are a funny thing because sometimes they can feel so lifelike that when you enter the real world, you kind of carry some of those emotions from the dream with you. So I remember one time I had this dream that Trina and I got into a horrible, horrible fight. I mean, like more terrible than any disagreement we've had in 10 years of marriage. You know, like there's a fight and then there's a fight fight. You know, and a fight fight is like, it's nuclear, it's atomic, the kids are diving for cover, the house roof is about to fall in. And this dream, it was a fight fight, and it was terrible. And I woke up from the dream feeling emotionally exhausted with this cloud hanging over me. You know, like that, that tension and awkwardness you feel when you've had a real fight. And I woke up feeling drained, and I walk out into the living room, and Trina's up, and she looks up and smiles and says, oh, good morning. And I was like, good morning? How do you dare say good after what you pulled? You know, and like that's my, my mentality. And I, of course, you have to stop and realize she's not to blame for anything. It was just a dream. Nothing actually happened, right? So what about in this story? Joseph has these two dreams that his brothers get furious about, and they're jealous of him. How could they hold that against him? Wasn't this just a dream? I mean, Joseph can't control the dreams that he was having, could he? Well, as it turns out, there was a lot of relational baggage that made these not just random dreams, but an infuriating development in a long and tumultuous family drama. Verses 1 through 4 kind of gives us the context of this family drama. You'll recall that Jacob, who has 12 sons, he had those 12 sons by means of two wives and two concubines. Of those four ladies in his life, Rachel was his favorite. That's the one he originally wanted to marry. That was his love. And it was Rachel who was unable to have children. So Jacob has 10 sons through these three other side pieces that he has. But his true love is barren. Till Joseph comes. Now at last, Jacob and his beloved have a child together. So you can imagine now how Jacob has sort of this biased inclination toward Joseph. And so we're told in verse 3 that Joseph is the golden boy. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And that's a startling admission. I think every parent in the room would admit, there's maybe some times where I have less patience with some kids than others. Maybe you even show favoritism in certain ways. But to actually come out and say, yeah, I love this kid more than all the others, that's a startling admission. And you can imagine, if you're one of Joseph's brothers, how that makes them feel. And this favoritism is seen from a, a very, very young age. If you remember the story about how Jacob was finally going to meet Esau again after 20 years apart, and he's worried that Esau might try to destroy his family. So he staggers his children kind of by rank, and he puts the maidservants and their sons first, and then Leah and her sons, and then last, he puts Rachel and Joseph. Why? Because if Esau attacks the other groups, maybe Joseph and Rachel can get away. So Jacob has been playing favorites this, this entire time. Not only is Joseph the favorite, but in his brother's eyes, he's a bit of a goody two-shoes. Verse 2 tells us that he had been working with his brothers. They were all out in the fields together, tending to their father's flocks. But apparently some of the other brothers start slacking off. You know, maybe they go for a dip when they shouldn't. Maybe they're napping on the job. Whatever it is, they're slacking off. And so Joseph goes back home and he informs their father, Jacob, that, hey, they weren't really being, uh, they didn't have a lot of integrity in their work today. And so when the boys get home, they get called into the boss's office. And you can imagine as Jacob is chewing them out for their negligent work, they're just shooting daggers with their eyes at Joseph the entire time. Because, you know, as the old saying goes, snitches get stitches. And so they're like probably looking at Joseph and, you know, you know, they, they, he tattled on dad. So not only is he the favorite, now he's daddy's little informant as well. Well, then it gets even worse. Verse 3 says that as an expression of this favoritism, Jacob makes Joseph a very special coat of many colors. This would be like in a family, the favorite child gets a brand new top-of-the-line video game console for Christmas. The other kids all get socks. And this escalates the tension so much that it says they hated him. They're not just irritated with him. Your kids probably get irritated with each other all the time. But this is well past irritation. This is hatred. Hatred is strong. Jesus described hatred as murder of the heart. Hatred is where you get to the point where you despise that person so thoroughly that you would rather they not exist at all. That's the context of Joseph's relationship with his brothers. So when he has these two dreams, and everybody who hears about them immediately understands what they mean. Basically, in this dream, these objects that represent Joseph are being bowed down to by these other objects that represent Joseph's brothers and even Joseph's father. So when, jo when Joseph's brothers hear this, they understand this isn't just a dream. 
We can't just laugh this off and move on with it. This was the nail in the coffin of their hatred. Now, I've heard some really good teachings on this chapter that will put a lot of emphasis on Joseph's supposed character flaw here. After all, maybe Joseph comes across as, as a little spoiled. Maybe he's a little arrogant sharing this dream with his brothers. We don't know that for sure. Moses, the author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, doesn't actually tell us Joseph's motivations or feelings here. Joseph shares with them a dream that we find out later God gave him. So that isn't necessarily a problem. We don't know what Joseph's intentions were in all of this. But you know what the author does draw our attention to? He draws our attention multiple times to the response of Joseph's brothers. Look at verse 4. His brothers hated him. Verse 5. They hated him even more. Verse 11. They were jealous of him. Verse 18. They conspired against him to kill him. Verse 24. They threw him into a pit. Verse 28, they sold him to the Ishmaelites. It is the sinful attitude and actions of Joseph's brothers that dominate this story. We read, didn't we, that they hated him. And there's probably many reasons for that hatred. But verse 11 pinpoints for us, I think, kind of the fuel behind this hatred. And it says they were jealous of him. At the root of their animosity is this threatened feeling of desire for what he had. It's not simply hatred. It's jealous hatred. And you know, there's various types of hatred. Just like there's different types of love, there's different types of hatred. There's a general hatred you might feel for a really evil person. Maybe you've never met them before, but they do wicked stuff, and so you have this general hatred for them. There's a bitter, vengeful sort of hatred where maybe somebody personally wrongs you. There's a prejudice hatred you might feel towards someone or towards another group simply because they're different from you. But today we read about a jealous hatred, a resentment that is fueled by jealousy. Jealousy is the green-eyed monster driving this story. And so I'd like to analyze this idea of jealousy a little bit more. That's where we're going to go to our second point. I've formulated a bit of a summary of jealousy. Here's how I would define jealousy, and I want to try to unpack this a little bit. Maybe I missed something. Maybe you would define it a little bit differently. This is my own concoction. Jealousy is a feeling, uh, or is feeling threatened by or being envious of what someone else has on the assumption that we're entitled to it. A few things about jealousy I'd I'd like to unpack here. First of all, at a basic level, jealousy is just desiring what someone else has. That's why God told us in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's oxen. Don't covet after the things your neighbor has. Don't feel jealous. Don't look and say, man, he's got that. I really wish I had that. That's a basic definition, but I think we could also make a distinction between jealousy and envy. We use those words interchangeably, but I think they're a little distinct. And I think the difference between envy and jealousy is I think jealousy is way more personal than envy. So let let me show you what I mean. Let's say you're a salesman for a company, and maybe you're a pretty good salesman. And then you hear about the salesman for another company who lives on the other side of the country, and he's even more successful than you are. You feel envious of this guy. Right? You feel envy. You, you, you kind of long to have what he has. Well, now let's say that guy gets hired by your company, and he comes in, and you were the hot shot at your company, but now he is. Now he's getting the biggest deals. He's raking in the most amount of sales. He is the, the popular figure around the water cooler. Well, now that moves from envy to jealousy, because now he's intruded on your personal world. Envy is just, oh, yeah, I see somebody out there who has what I want. I wish I had it. Jealousy is sort of this sense of being threatened by someone intruding on your... They're actually taking away from what you thought should have been yours. That's jealousy. I think it's way more personal. It's a form of envy, but it's way more personal in nature. And I think this is from a sense of entitlement. Jealousy stems from entitlement. It's not simply wanting what someone else has. It's looking at what somebody else has and saying, why should they have that? I should have. I deserve that. What have they done that gives them the right? No, it should be me. Jealousy crosses the line simply from envy or even just desiring what somebody has, and it goes into this assumption that I deserve it in some way. Why should they have it and not me? You know, in our nation, we really love this idea of rights, and I think that's good. I think rights are kind of the the pillar of a free society, but sometimes we go a little too radical with this idea of, of rights. We've now taken the idea of rights and we've escalated into this idea that people should give me stuff. Right? I am entitled to get things. That's what we think a right is now. 
right? So maybe, maybe you and I get a little irritated politically, right? And I'm not going to get off on politics here, but maybe you hear about the redefinition of rights and, oh, people just want stuff and everybody wants life to be an easy platter handed to them. We, but I think we get a little hypocritical about that sometimes because you may not look at things politically that way, but I guarantee we look at it that way in our personal day-to-day -day life. You and I have a strong sense of entitlement to our own rights. So for example, maybe you come home and you've been at the office all day and you know, your spouse wants you to help with something around the house, your kids want your attention, they wanna play with you and you say, oh, I've worked hard all day. I deserve to sit down with my phone or my television and just have everybody leave me alone. Right? I'm entitled to that, that's my right. Or maybe you think, I've had a rough life, I've had bad things happen to me, I deserve to be happy. Or sometimes we even instill this mentality in our kids. I've heard children say things before like, well, all my friends have a tablet. I deserve one. You know, I'm bored. I deserve to be entertained. Whenever we say things like this, we're assuming we have a right to something. And that notion of self-entitlement is what leads to jealousy because we get it in our minds that we deserve something. And if we see somebody else with it, we think, wait a second, what are they doing with that? Give it here. It, it should be mine. Not only that, but jealousy is often provoked by a sense of insecurity. At the root of a lot of jealousy is insecurity. If I don't feel accomplished in my job, I might feel jealous of someone who's more successful at it than me. If I'm self-conscious of my physical appearance, I may feel jealous when a better looking man enters the room. If I'm discontent with the size or the aesthetics of my house, I might feel jealous when someone with a bigger or a prettier home than mine comes on the scene. Our jealousy often stems from seeing somebody with something that we feel really insecure about in our own life. Not only that, but jealousy creates constant rivals and constant suspicion. I think we think about it like this. Anybody who has what I want that I think I deserve, or anybody who makes me feel insecure about my, my own success, that person is now my rival. Their personal conduct doesn't matter a bit. For Joseph's brothers, it didn't matter if Joseph was upstanding or not. Joseph's personal integrity did not matter to his brothers. What mattered is that he was a threat and he was a rival for the thing that they wanted. He's my competition, therefore I hate him. Think about, have you ever been jealous of somebody? Have you ever stopped to get to know that person or seen the integrity of their character? Or is it just they make you feel challenged and threatened and insecure and full of covetousness? Therefore, they're your enemy. Jealousy provokes this unnecessary sense of rivalry. But not only that, it also casts the other person's move under constant suspicion. Think about it. When you become jealous of somebody, you interpret their every word and their every move through this filter of, of suspicion. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4 says. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 4 says, Wrath is cruel, anger is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? The assumption is you can stand up to an angry person. You can stand up to a wrathful person. I don't like dealing with angry people. You know, anger is like a consuming fire. But the inspired author of Proverbs identified there's a trait even more destructive than anger. You think of like an angry hothead as like the peak of aggression, the most difficult person to deal with. Proverbs says no. It's not the angry person. It's the jealous person. Why? Because anger is like a fire. It can flare up and it can settle down. But jealousy is a poison that infects and taints everything. It can even lead you to read things into a situation that aren't actually there. Listen, this is another quote from Othello, that Shakespeare play we talked about earlier. This is another quote. It says, trifles as light as air are to the jealous confirmations strong as proofs of holy writ. What does that even mean? It means there could be a trifle that is really not any indication of anybody doing anything wrong. But if you are jealous of that person, that seemingly insignificant trifle becomes like black and white scripture that they're doing something wrong. Because you're looking at it with a bias. You come ready to be upset at them. Think about maybe a wife feels a great deal of insecurity and she's convinced that her husband's being unfaithful. He hasn't really done anything to merit that, but she has this insecurity about it. Suddenly, everything he does testifies to his guilt. Every word and action can be reinterpreted in this way. Uh, maybe, you know, he's at the store five minutes longer than he said he would be, right? He's on his phone for 30 seconds. <gasps> Who are you talking to? 
what, what, what's really happening. Or maybe there's an employee. They feel a great deal of insecurity about their job. And so they're convinced that their boss is giving this other employee special favors, and there's this conspiracy to get them out. Suddenly, every time you see the boss and this other employee talking, now you're convinced that it's about you. And all they're doing is just scheming to get you out of the equation. That it becomes so pervasive. That's why Proverbs says, who can stand before jealousy? In the court of jealousy, the judges gavel relentlessly and only ever issues out the verdict, guilty, guilty, guilty. It infects the way you think and feel and approach every situation. And this poison has so thoroughly infected Joseph's brothers that it leads to this anger. And this undealt with jealous anger leads to drink. And that brings us to the next part in our story. Point number three, we see that the jealous anger of Joseph's brothers leads to a moral tailspin as one thing leads to another. There's a scene from a sitcom a couple of years ago where there's this dad, he goes into a room and he flips the light. Ah, oh, the light bulb's not working. Okay, so now he, he goes to the shelf where the light bulbs are and oh, the shelf is falling apart. Oh, I gotta fix it. All right, let me go to my, my junk drawer and get out my screwdriver. And he opens up the junk drawer. Oh, it, it's wedged shut, it's, it, it, it's stuck. Let me go get the WD-40 so I can undo the, the, the drawer here. Oh, I'm out of WD-40. I'm going to get in the car and go buy some more. Oh, the car engine isn't starting. What's wrong with this thing? And so in the next scene, he's in his garage, and his car is apart in a million pieces, and he's under the hood covered in grease, and he's got wrenches everywhere, and, he's fit, and the wife comes in, and she goes, hey, honey, did, did you change that light bulb yet? And he goes, what does it look like I'm doing? You know, like sometimes one thing has a way of spiraling into something else. Something little can escalate into something else. That's how sin often works, and that's exactly how jealousy works here. Would you please note the digression of these chain, this chain of events with Joseph and his brothers? It starts with just daddy issues, and then it leads to them gritting their teeth at the favor that Joseph is receiving. Oh, they wish it belonged to them. And that jealousy leads into this anger, and this anger leads to action. What kind of action? Verse 20, they say, let's kill him and then hide the body in a pit. That is quite a dramatic escalation, isn't it? Let's murder him and then hide the carcass. They've become so consumed with jealousy that they believe no route is left other than violent force. Now, Reuben, the firstborn, he, he kind of speaks some sense in the search, and he's like, hey, guys, that's a little extreme. We shouldn't kill him. Well, let's take his robe and throw him in a pit anyway. And then Judah, who is the fourthborn, Judah also says, yeah, let's not kill him. Let's get something out of it. Because he actually tells them in verse 26, he says, what profit are we going to get out of it if we just kill him? Like, let's get something out of it. Here's these Midianite traders passing on their way down to Egypt. How about, we, I like the plan, let's get rid of him, let's fake his, uh, you know, we'll fake his death, tell our father he's gone, but instead of actually killing him, let's just sell him into slavery, and then we get some money out of it. So that's what they do. They sell him off to slavery with these Ishmaelite traders, and so what do they do here? Think about how this is escalated. What starts from just jealousy of their brother, they now betray him, they sell him like a piece of property to this caravan where he's going to be carted off to a faraway land where as far as they're concerned, he's never going to see his father or his family again. And then not only that, but now they have to cover their tracks. So they take this special coat of many colors. They actually kill an animal. They dip the robe in blood and they say, oh, dad, it's Joseph. But look what happened. And Jacob is to the point where he basically doesn't want to live anymore. He says, no, there's no comfort to be found. All that's waiting for me now is to go to Sheol, go to the place of the dead. Someday, just let my sad head lay down in death so I can be reunited with my son. So not only do they now have this guilt against their brother, but now they're, they're tearing down their father as well. They are just wreaking this tangled web of moral chaos, bringing sorrow upon sorrow on everybody's head. Now, maybe you hear that and you think, oh, thank goodness I'm not that bad. You know, I've, I've experienced jealousy. You probably have too. But at least I can take comfort in the fact that I've never tied somebody up, stuck them in a box, and shipped them off to work in some uh, labor factory over in a communist nation somewhere. You know, th that would be an extreme reaction. So maybe we think we're safe. But let this be a warning, church, of what extreme jealousy can lead to. You and I are no different than these. The same sinful nature of Adam runs in their veins as it does in ours. You and I should never read any moral failing in the Bible and say, I'm beyond that. I couldn't. You could. I could. Everyone who has done these types of things at one point in their life said, I could never do that. Go to our fourth point. Jealousy will consume you. And I want to emphasize that. 
Jealousy will consume you to the point of doing the unthinkable. It is a gateway to many other I read a news story recently about a man, a fairly young man, who was jealous towards his wife. And so he arranged to have their young children go and stay with the in-laws. He waited at home for her with a kitchen knife. When she got home, he, tab- he stabbed her 10 times and threw her off a 13-story building. Tragic. What made it more tragic is that this news story included pictures of the couple from their wedding day several several years earlier. I can all but guarantee, if you were to hop in a time machine and go back to that couple's wedding day, and you ask them there, as they're in their tux and their dress and they're, they're drinking champagne, and you were to ask them, do you think it's possible that this husband would ever someday kill his wife in cold blood? I'm guessing they would probably say no. That shows you what sin does, doesn't it? If you were to go back to the day Joseph was born, Joseph is a baby, and his brothers are all taking a turn holding him, looking at their, oh, welcome to the bro club, and then they're laughing at all of his antics. If you were to ask them on that day, do you think you will ever want to kill Joseph, sell him into slavery, stage his death? At the time, no. If I were to pull up a list on this screen right now of egregious sins and ask you, Christian, would you do any of these things? Most of us would probably say absolutely not. But we're deceiving ourselves because we are capable through little compromises that are undealt with, dragged out over enough time, there is almost nothing apart from the grace of God that our sinful nature is not capable of. Sin has a way of spiraling, and the same is true of jealousy. It starts with just this little twinge that you first feel when it all starts. One little twinge of jealousy, and it blazes into a giant. We see constant examples of this throughout Scripture. Remember the story of King Ahab and Naboth? Naboth has this vineyard that King Ahab really, really wants for himself. And when Ahab can't get it, he's all depressed. So what happens? Him and Jezebel form this whole thing where they create these false accusations of Naboth that he's blasphemed God. And they stage uh, his guilt so that he gets put to death. And then Ahab can take Naboth's vineyard. All started with jealousy. Think about the religious leaders. There's this really insightful verse in Matthew 27, verses 17 to 18, where Jesus is on trial before Pilate. And as Pilate is inquiring of Jesus, it says, Pilate knows exactly why the religious leaders want Jesus dead. Not because Jesus did anything wrong, but Matthew says because they were envious of him. They were jealous of Jesus. They felt threatened by Jesus. Here is a man who had devoted his whole ministry to healing the sick, helping the least of these teaching about the truth of God, who's come to save his people from their sins, and yet these religious leaders who should have been first in line to worship Jesus, they've not only rejected him, they not only hate him, but they're now striving with all their might for his unjust murder. Why? Because they were jealous. You see how this little thing can burn into a great big fire. Now, one quick note I want to say before we go on to our final point. I'm not saying that Jacob is justified for showing favorites. And I think that's really important here. I don't think Jacob is justified for that. But here's the thing. Joseph's brothers are not just mere products of their environment. They are responsible for their response. I think Jacob is wrong. And I think as parents, we need to take heed of that. And Jacob should have known this better than anybody. Jacob comes from a family line of favorites. You remember how terrible it was? Remember, Jacob was his mom's favorite. Esau was his dad's favorite, and they were pitted against each other, and there was deception, and Esau wanted to kill Jacob, and there was this whole big rigmarole. Jacob has seen and is a living example of what favoritism can do. Jacob saw it in his own marriage with Leah and Rachel, these two sisters who are jealous of each other, and it causes all sorts of problems in Jacob's household. He should have known better than anybody. And yet he still shows his favoritism towards Joseph. So parents, just let that be a quick note. If you find it easier to love some of your kids more than others, just as a warning, giving in to that impulse is one of the fastest ways to produce broken men and broken women. Now, Jacob is wrong. However, Joseph's brothers are not then excused for their response. They would be right to feel sad, but that does not excuse them before the Lord. You guys and me, just because somebody does wrong to us does not give us the right to lash out however we want. And the same is true of jealousy. If you're wrestling with jealousy over something this morning, maybe you have a legitimate reason to be upset, but maybe you don't. Either way, you're not, here's what you're responsible for. You're responsible for how you react to that. 
Joseph's brothers have the wrong reaction. So what do we do with all this as we get ready to wrap up? What do we do with all this? Well, let's bring it to the foot of Calvary and behold our solution. Let's pull up our fifth and final point. I want to show this morning how the problem of jealousy, the gospel is the antidote to this poison. I want to give you three reasons why the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ died for our sins, rose again on the third day, he ascended on high, and right now he's reigning at the Father's right hand. How can this make all the difference in the world? Well, first of all, at the cross, we see the punishment that we deserve. And this should strip us, strip us of our entitlement. Think about this with me. As we behold Christ crucified, we see the ultimate picture of suffering. Not simply physical torture on a Roman cross. Sometimes we reduce the crucifixion of Jesus to just physical suffering on a wooden cross. And that's true. It was graphic. But what was far worse was the spiritual agony he endured as God's righteous wrath was poured out on him. And yet, you know what we don't often stop to do? We don't often stop and look at the cross and we see Christ suffering hell on the cross and we don't stop and say, that should have been me. That should have been me. Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He died for mine. He died for yours. What happened to Jesus is what I deserve. Now, how does that help with our jealousy? Well, we said earlier that a key ingredient of jealousy is self-entitlement, the idea that I deserve something good. But the reality of my sin and the reality of Christ's death for my sin strips me of that self-entitlement. Because when I look at the cross, I see what I'm actually entitled to. You know what I'm entitled to? God's wrath. You know what's rightfully mine? You know what I deserve? God's judgment for my sin. As a sinner who's willfully broken God's law over and over and over again, what I deserve is God's righteous judgment. Because here's the thing. In jealousy, we look at what others have and we say, ooh, that should be mine. Let me figure out how I can take it. But in the gospel, we can look at our crucified Lord and say, oh, that's what should have been mine. And Jesus willingly took it. If you're going to look at anything and say, I deserve it, look at the cross and be astounded that Jesus suffered it and be stripped of that sin. Secondly, at the empty tomb, we receive the life that we don't deserve and we are given more than any temporary. You know, another key ingredient in jealousy is this feeling that what I have is not enough. Somebody else has something that I'm missing, but there is nothing more that could possibly be given to us than the eternal life that Christ secured by his resurrection. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 puts it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Ephesians 1.3 says something very similar. It says he's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly. You hear that? Every spiritual blessing. Do you and I have all the earthly blessings that we wish we had? No, but we've got something better. Every spiritual eternal blessing that could be given, God has graciously bestowed on us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is nothing you and I are lacking. Temporarily, sure. Would we like a bigger house? Would we like a happier marriage? Would we like a better paying job? Sure. But God has given us infinitely more in the resurrection of his son. We don't need to be jealous of what other people have. Why? Because what more could God give us than what he's given us? In and then the last thing here is at the right hand of the Father, we have favor through the beloved son. We're welcome to share in the most exclusive favoritism of all time. I said earlier, another ingredient in jealousy is insecurity. We feel jealous whenever our place in a social group or in someone's heart is challenged. But in Christ, there is ultimate security because nothing can separate us from the love of God. As long as Jesus stands living at the right hand of the Father, being our advocate, there is nothing that can, there is no chance of insecurity. There is no other force or person who is going to remove us from that, that circle. As long as Jesus lives, he's our advocate. But another ingredient of jealousy is this feeling of rivalry. You know, 
When, whenever there's this person who received what we desire, what we think should be ours, just like in the story of Joseph, who's the rival? It's the favorite. Whoever the favorite is, whoever the golden boy is, that's who we envy, right? Because the golden boy has it all, and you and I don't. But here's what happens in the gospel. In the gospel, the favorite, the golden boy, the beloved son, actually welcomes us to share in it. Think about it this way. There has never been a more favored, a more beloved, or a more special son than Jesus. For all of the favoritism Joseph, uh, Jacob showed to Joseph, I guarantee it does not compare to the amount of favoritism and love and delight that God the Father shows Jesus Christ. When Christ was baptized, God said, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. God's love for the son is greater than any other type of love you can imagine. No one has ever been more favored than Jesus. He's far and away the father's favorite. But guess what Jesus now does? He doesn't go around flaunting his coat of many colors and say, no, 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 look what I have. Now he graciously invites us to come and share in that. Hebrews 2.11 says he is not ashamed to call us his brothers. Jesus is like a better Joseph. He takes his sinful brothers into the presence of the father and says, hey, dad, them too. They share in this. And with that newfound gospel truth, church, we don't have to view happy or successful people with suspicion or envy. When we see what we actually deserve versus what we have been given in Christ, jealousy ought to be put to death. I'm going to ask our ushers to please prepare the Lord's Supper and get ready to bring it forward. And I want to leave you with this. Maybe the year 2022 had its share of disappointments for you. Maybe you watched other people experience a happiness that you thought should have been yours. Maybe somebody hurt you and they seem to prosper, and you believe that their success rightfully belongs to you, perhaps you've felt that angry jealousy Joseph's brothers did. Oh, church, beware the green-eyed monster, for it will consume you and escalate your life into chaotic sin and misery. Instead, use this new year to behold with fresh eyes and marvel God has provided for us. Let the green-eyed monster of jealousy melt into the loving eyes of as we behold Jesus suffering what we deserve, gifting us with infinitely more than we can imagine, and inviting us to share in the greatest privilege, and let all other envious trifles become dim. I'm going to ask Pastor Chris to come forward now.